Okay, uh, let's move to the next segment uh, of our today's session. Uh, actually, this session is for data dictionaries for analysts. This uh, segment will be conducted by Dilip Madhushankar. He is a project manager at Nagro as of now. Actually, he has uh, 10 years plus ex industry experience in IT industry uh, with five year five years of experience in project management, business analysis as well as product management. And he's also a certified uh, business analyst professional as well as a certified project management professional. And uh, he likes to share his experience uh, with others uh, in the uh, industry and uh, especially with uh, project managers and business analysts. Because of that, uh, he accepted our invitation and uh, he uh, decided to deliver this uh, segment, uh, Data Dictionaries for Analysts. So uh, over to you, Dilip. You can start your session now. Thank you, Madhuga. So hope you can hear me. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. You can share your screen now. Yeah, yeah. We, we can see it, Dilip. You can carry on. Yep. So the entities and the attributes discussed earlier in this session can easily be represented and documented using data dictionary technique. So this technique was so popular back in the day once when we were doing waterfall approach, but um, we were we, we were able to see this everywhere in almost every software requirement specification or detailed software requirement specification which were articulated back then. But with the recent paradigm shift towards agile mindset, we hardly see this in practice right now. The motive behind discussing this in greater detail today is to emphasize the importance and the applicability of this technique, irrespective of the methodology or the framework followed by your teams. To start with, uh, let's try to define the term dictionary. Anybody volunteering to unmute him or herself and share thoughts? Okay. So if not, I'll move ahead. So a dictionary could be either a book or an electronic resource that lists the data, that lists the words of language and giving it, giving its meanings. So when it comes to data dictionary, it has the same attributes as of a dictionary, but the categorization based on how the data elements are being structured. Data dictionaries are used to standardize the usage and the meanings of data elements between solutions as well as between stakeholders. Data dictionaries are sometimes referred to as metadata repositories and are used to manage the data within the context of a solution. As organizations nowadays adapt to data mining and more advanced analytics, a data dictionary may provide metadata required for more, more of these complex scenarios. Data dictionaries are even are often used in conjunction with entity relationship diagrams, just like Sabri explained. So data dictionaries provide a way of documentation for the complete database system in one single place. This would help us to eliminate any ambiguity while keeping the work of programmers and the designers synchronized by using same object reference everywhere in the program. Validation of data flow diagrams could be carried out using data dictionary as well. Specifically talking about the timing, data dictionary would mainly be used when designing and implementing a software, as well as during database restructuring and revamps. Data dictionary contains two main types of data elements, namely primitive data elements and composite data elements. Primitive data elements contain basic information about data elements. So, in this given uh, example of a data dictionary, I, I have listed three data elements. So, and a set of attributes as rows. So the, so the first row for the name um, is, is its unique name. So moving to the other ones, 
the data the data element the data dictionary so these elements may also have aliases in addition to unique names you will of you will see this often when different stakeholder groups call the same data elements using different terminologies out of which some stakeholders should use given name and surname instead of first and the last names so we use data dictionaries to list down those different terminologies similarly we can use the value and meaning row to list down sample values which could either be a single value or a collection of values moving on to composite data elements composite data elements are assembled of from primitive data elements composite data elements allow users to manage multiple pieces of related data as a single composite data element in order to discuss some key usages let's try to build up a hypothesis around a bookstore application for this hypothesis let's think of a scenario where we get a handful of data entry operators to upload a series of children's books to a database which will then be utilized by a website with a payment gateway integration so this is going to be a snippet of the database how the real real life data are are going to look like so here i have four different columns one for book name publisher name published year and lastly number of pages and uh, looking at this data database table this is going to be our data dictionary which corresponds to that so all the said uh, columns are listed as rows here explaining what the field is what's the data type is and the format length and the description again coming back to the same database itself let's think in the lines of improving efficiency and accuracy the bottom line is data entry is costly and erroneous i want all of you to think of ways we can improve the efficiency and accuracy any ideas so somebody is going to sit and enter this data to a database can you come up with ways and means we can improve the efficiency and accuracy of the data which are been entered into the database you can answer the question or you can type it out in the chat box okay so if i go all by myself here what i can see is a few number of publisher names and they two are being repeated so again if you take this as a helper line can anyone think of a way around how to improve the uh, process of data entry so i only see an array or a or a fixed set of data that are been okay so sahan is saying uh, having a unique id for each book publisher name okay i mean different i'm trying to understand what he's trying to say and how the how that is going to help me in this scenario but again sahan now what i'm if i were you what i'm going to propose is is to abbreviate the publisher's name this long publisher's name let's try to abbreviate and come up with codes so okay so if we if we agree agree upon a set of codes this would help this would make the data entry faster and takes less space from the database and obviously this will reduce multiple different records due to spelling mistakes so if you are going to use this kind of codes obviously you need a data dictionary to explain them 
So now in my data dictionary, I am going to list down the codes against the, the uh, longer publisher names so that it's clear and transparent. Hope you all are following. Any questions? Okay, I'm going to continuously use the same hypothesis. So if you have questions, uh, please put them on the chat. And again, think of another way. Think of another possibility of things going wrong. Anything we could do to avoid incorrect years being recorded into the database? What if we set up a validation prior entering data to the database? So again, if you are to uh, if you are to include a validation like this, similar to the previous scenario, we should use a data dictionary to explain such validations. So, so far this has been the uh, illustration of the data dictionary. Now that for us to uh, elaborate the validation, we can add up a new, new row, new column, sorry, and uh, spell out that validation, which we are going to uh, mandate. Again, um, I'm throwing a couple of scenarios. Just by looking at the data in the data set, published year would look like a number, but you cannot treat them as numbers because published years are not numbers. So again, uh, trying to simplify uh, what I'm trying to convey is you can find the difference between two years that's a valid scenario, but when, but you cannot add them together because ad the addition won't make any sense. Having the correct data type explained in the data dictionary would help developers avoid these kind of mistakes. So that's where we define the correct data type in front of each of those uh, elements. Moving on, uh, I guess this should be the last scenario. Again, feel free to uh, unmute and speak up or share your thoughts. Now again, I'm to throw another scenario where think that you now come across a book which has more than 100 pages. You have a limitation of two characters. If I go back here, here I, I have two characters length. So that's a limitation in the existing solution. So now still with having this limitation, I need to figure out a way to, to enter that specific book, which has more than 100 pages. I want you to think of a short term fix, a mitigation strategy without going to the extent of revamping or redesigning the database structure. Any idea? My problem is how can I enter, for an example, 200, where I'm only eligible to input only two characters? Any creative ideas? So, what I propose is preserve the value of 99. If you have 10 pages, yes, we can use the number 10. If you have 98 pages, you can use the number 98. But anything equal or beyond 99, you can use, you can basically preserve this word 99. So the front end people for the for the interest of this short time period they can implement a uh, quick fix until until the uh, until the huge or the correction is done, being done on the database side so such fixes again should be elaborated uh, and spelled out in the data dictionary 
am I clear? So here, what I'm trying to say is we are preserving the number 99, even for the instances where we go beyond where a book has more than 100 pages. Okay. Then uh, thus far, we were discussing of data dictionaries creating creating by using spreadsheet applications. Apart from creating data dictionaries using spreadsheets, let's, let's explore a few other alternatives. So we could use a database management system along with a graphical user interface. Most commonly we found nowadays is MySQL with MySQL Workbench. Another option is to use a database documentation tool like Redgate SQL. Another way uh, is to use data modeling tools like MySQL Workbench. And the fourth and the last option I'm listing is to use a pure data dictionary tool like data edu. And uh, finally, looking ahead at future, a crucial part of every company's business intelligence is going to be based on data dictionary. When you have a well-structured data dictionary, you provide BI teams an easy way to track and manage metadata throughout the entire enterprise. Compiling a data dictionary by hand is pretty easier said than done. But just imagine how much effort and time it would be required to create an enterprise level data dictionary manually and even going little more than that to keep that uh, relevant and keep that up to date. It's going to take a lot of effort and uh, there would be lots of mistakes happen here and there. So due to this sheer volume of data that most companies are currently working with, automation is necessary to unlock the complete potential of the data dictionary technique as a whole. So Madhuk, I come to the final slide, so. Yeah. Okay, it's high time to raise the questions related to this uh, segment, data dictionary, so analyst, uh, and Dilip is willing to answer those questions. Uh, you can unmute yourself and raise the question, or you can type it out in the chat box. Or if you have any question related to the previous session, introduction to ER diagrams, those questions can also be raised now. So we have around 10 minutes time, uh, we can answer those questions. And uh, so uh, try to get the maximum out of these two uh, presenters because uh, they are experts in, in the segments which they were uh, presenting. So uh, it, uh, it is high time for you to raise the questions and again, the understanding and uh, clear out any concern if you have. Again, if no one has questions, I will, I will throw a question at uh, all of you. I do understand nowadays, most of you are into agile, into user stories, um, mindset more, more towards agile. So, and uh, looking at this explanation, you all will think, okay, this will benefit uh, database engineers. Th this will benefit backend people. But looking at the audience of a BA, BA folks here, um, if you are practicing agile and if you are writing user stories so that the front end developers or the back end developers need to do their code base looking at the data dictionary. And uh, I'm, I'm thinking that most of the teams will use some kind of modeling tools like sub workbench, whichever the thing. So when it comes to you writing user stories, how can you, how are you going to make use of data dictionaries? That's my question. So even 
if I answer all by myself again, rather letting um, architects and the engineers to figure it out, like once they put down their database, they, they, they themselves can generate a data dictionary with these automated tools. But in your scale as a BA, if you could document the data, data dictionary and keep it somewhere in the confluence and refer it every now and then when you are in the stages of features, epics, so that whenever people have questions in, when it comes to their uh, user stories, task or subtask, they now have a, they now could have a direct reference to the uh, structure of the database or the data dictionary so that uh, they could uh, avoid making mistakes. Am I clear? Does anyone disagree? We have eight more minutes to complete the session for today. So if you have any questions, you can raise those things now. Okay, Dilipa. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for your participation and for your valuable time for uh, today's session. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, uh, we will share some way to communicate with us. Uh, if you have any questions related to uh, two sessions today, so you can raise those things uh, via those modes also. So uh, thanks a lot, Dilip, again. Yeah. So thank you very much for giving the opportunity. So if there are any questions, even afterwards, please feel free to use the channels and uh, reach out to me or Sabri, anyone in this forum. Thank you. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, these are the channels which you can uh, communicate with us. Uh, if you want to email us, uh, this is the email address, the bameetup at gmail.com. And we have a, a, a LinkedIn uh, group uh, and uh, in, uh, uh, by using this link, you can uh, uh, log on onto the li LinkedIn and uh, find out our group also. In Facebook also, uh, we have a, a group called BA Meetup. Simply you can search uh, by typing BA Meetup there and uh, find out our Facebook uh, page in Facebook. So uh, if you have any doubt, any concern, any question related to today's session, you can email us or you can uh, put a message via LinkedIn or via Facebook and we will clear those things out. Uh, the participants who participate via Facebook Live, they can also uh, raise their uh, questions uh, as a comment uh, for the live stream. And uh, last, uh, we would like to uh, we would like to let you know that uh, if you are interested in doing any sessions uh, in this uh, next ca coming up uh, uh, BA meets BA meetups, so feel free to contact us. Then uh, we can facilitate for those uh, kind of sessions as well. I think uh, we are uh, five, uh, five minutes ahead from the plan, but it's okay. So. Uh, finally, the same thing again, that if you have any questions, uh, pass those things. And uh, we are currently, we are planning to wind up for the session for this uh, May edition. And uh, hopefully we will be meet by uh, end of June for the uh, BA Meetup uh, 2021 uh, June edition. And uh, thanks again for all the participants, uh, even though it's a Friday evening after completing a full working week. So we know you are, be tired and but uh, by uh, taking some time and uh, for the participation. So uh, thanks again and we will meet uh, in June session. Thank you.